Okay, we're probably going to get some folks trickling in. But thank you so much to everyone who is here so far, who is joining us on this beautiful afternoon to hear some untold history with the Lexington Historical Society. We thank you for your support all throughout this Patriots Day, and we are very pleased to be closing out our regularly scheduled programming uh, this week um, with Don Haggist, who is a local historian, reenactor, editor of the Journal of the American Revolution, and um, all around amazing speaker, who will be presenting to us um, about his latest book on on the British Redcoat experience, which is called Noble Volunteers. Before we get started, I would just like to get some housekeeping out of the way. If you have not been to a webinar before, if you hover your mouse around the bottom of your screen, you will see several buttons, including a chat window where you can put any technical questions for us, as well as a Q&A at the end of the talk. We will have some time for questions and it helps if any of your historically related queries are put in the Q&A box so that I can see them and make sure that we have time to get to all of your inquiries. And before we get into the meat of the program, I would just like to briefly share with you for anyone who has not been to one of our programs before, a short video just explaining a little bit more about what we do here at the Lexington Historical Society. Hello, my name is Chris Kaufman, and I'm the Education and Interpretation Manager at Lexington Historical Society. Lexington Historical Society is more than a historical society. We're storytellers, fact finders, educators, and community gatherers. Our historic house museums not only tell the stories of the past, but help us think about the world today and how we can shape the future. Every year, we welcome thousands of visitors to Lexington to learn about the first shots of the American Revolution. They come from around the world, around the country, and even right here in Massachusetts. In the community, we offer educational programs for both adults and children, including lectures, workshops, and summer camps. We work with local school districts to enhance their American history curricula so students can learn about history in an engaging way. Our recently completed Archives and Research Center offers state-of-the-art storage capabilities for our historical material, a new safe workspace for volunteers and staff, as well as an inviting spacious research library for residents, scholars, and students. We hope you can join us for one of our programs, whether it's in person or virtual, or possibly take a tour of one of our museums. We love having community members get involved with us and enjoy the history of Lexington. You can help keep local history alive by supporting our important mission and donating today. Thank you. All right, thanks very much. And I'm just gonna put a spotlight on here so that everyone can see you. Thank you so much for joining us today, Don. Oh, thank you very much. And thanks to everyone who's here for this program, especially on this lovely Saturday afternoon. Um, I hope you'll come away knowing some things that you didn't know beforehand. Is it time to start and share my screen? Sounds good. Okay, great. So you saw that video and you saw a variety of soldiers doing different things. And most of you know that um, on April 19, 1775, a large number of British soldiers passed through Lexington and then later in the day passed back through Lexington a second time. Um, and I research and study those soldiers. In particular, I like to study them not as an amalgamated mass of amorphous people, but as individuals who joined the army for some reason or another, and then served a career in it, and then left the army. And I like to learn where they came from and where they went, as well as what happened during their careers. Um, I've been studying this for a long time, long enough to actually put together a book about it. And there's a picture of the cover here. The book is about 330 pages long. And so I'm going to spend the first half of this presentation talking almost exclusively about the title. Um, it's Noble Volunteers, the British Soldiers Who Fought the American Revolution. And that little subtext in yellow there, the British Soldiers Who Fought the American Revolution is important because this book is in fact about soldiers 
it's by that I mean it's not about the officers, it's about the men in the ranks, it's about private soldiers, drummers, fifers, corporals, and sergeants in the British Army during the American Revolution. And it's entirely about British soldiers in the regular army. So this book doesn't talk at all about the German or Hessian allies. It doesn't talk at all about loyalist soldiers. It doesn't talk about Native American allies. Those are other topics for other people. This is focused just on the professional soldiers from Great Britain who fought in this war in America. Um, there is some material about men who were in the ranks as soldiers who became officers during their career. It wasn't a common career path, but it did happen to some men. And there are a lot of writings by officers in this book when they're talking about the common soldiers and a lot of material about the relationship between officers and soldiers. But the focus is on the soldiers and the focus is on the infantry. Focus is on the infantry because most of the British soldiers who fought in the American Revolution were infantry. The British Army had cavalry regiments and it had a substantial amount of artillery. Some cavalry and some artillery fought in the Revolution, but most of the soldiers were in fact infantry. Much of the material in this book is actually in common for the cavalrymen and the artillerymen as well, but some of it isn't particularly material about recruiting and training. Those kinds of things differed between the infantry, the artillery, and the cavalry, and I simply didn't have enough space in the book to include all of them. I have to put boundaries somewhere. So in America, we have mostly infantry, and that's mostly what this book is about. And my emphasis in talking about soldiers is on diversity, not commonality. And it's very common to look at a picture like this one and just think, well, there's a bunch of soldiers, and assume they're probably all quite similar. And in some ways, they have similarities. But if you look at any population, if you think simply about all the people attending this webinar, and if you want to characterize this, us all only by the things we have in common, it really doesn't give the, this population any texture and any depth. So we start to really understand all the people in the army when we start looking at how they have things different from each other more than how we see what they all have in common. Um, here's a couple of other very good books on the subject. Um, Red Coat, The British Soldier in the Age of Horse and Musket, that covers a very broad time period. And this one from the 1970s called The British Soldier in America. They're great books, but I look at both of these titles and I say, well, The British Soldier, like there was only one of them. Well, there were a lot more than just one and the differences between these di different individuals is important in a lot of ways. Now, the main part of the title is Noble Volunteers. And I had a lot of people ask me questions on this as soon as I decided on the title. They said, why, why call it that when you're talking about soldiers in the British Army? Well, during this time period, most of the British soldiers, in fact, just about all of them who fought in the American Revolution, joined the Army in the 1760s and 1770s. There were some who joined in the 1750s, and there were some who joined in the early 1780s. Of course, the war ended in 1783, but most are in the 1760s and 1770s. And during that time period, there were four ways that you as a man could get into the army. One of those ways was voluntary enlistment. One of those ways was to be born in the army. So your father is in the army and um, your family follows the army where it goes, and you grow up in that environment, decide to join the army yourself. You could get into the army as an alternative to prison, and you could be pressed into the army. Well, all of these are ways to get in the army, but there's a lot of differences that they're not all common ways to get in the army. They're not all very important when we want to talk about the army as a whole. So I'm going to talk about each of those these things briefly in reverse, in, excuse me, in reverse order of importance. So of all these four ways to get in the army during the American Revolution, we look at all the soldiers in the Revolutionary War, the British ones who fought here, the smallest number of them got into the army by impressment. How could that be? Um, if you read almost anything about the American Revolution, you'll get the impression that pressing was a common way for men to join the army. Turns out it wasn't. 
for most of the war in America, it wasn't legal for the British government, for the British army to press men into service. It was never legal in peacetime during the 18th century. So if there was no war going on, you couldn't be pressed into the army. Once the American war began in 1775, you still couldn't be pressed into the army. In fact, you couldn't be pressed into the army until the very end of May, 1778. I wrote June here because the law went into effect right at the very end of May. And then the law was repealed again in May of 1780. Remember the war ended in 1783. So for an eight year war, there was only a two year period when it was possible for men to be pressed into the British army. And even when it was legal to do so, there were strict rules about it. There were limited places where men could be pressed. You couldn't just press men anywhere in Great Britain only during certain seasons of the year within this two year period. So during this time when pressing was legal, only about 10% of all of the recruits for the British army were pressed men. Now that's not the army, not 10% of the entire army, but 10% of the new recruits that were raised during those two years. The very first pressed men who arrived in America got here in October of 1779. And they accounted for about 5% of all of the new recruits that arrived in America that year. To give that a little context, again, the book goes into great detail about this. It gives all these numbers. It talks about the law specifically and why it was put in place and how well and how poorly it worked. But in 1779, the first pressed men arrived in America, about 1,300 British recruits arrived in America that year, and only about 5% of them were pressed. Now, there were close to 50,000 British troops in America at this time, so hardly any. So if we look at all of the British soldiers who served in the American Revolution, we have fewer than 1% of them who were pressed, and they only show up in America after 1779, or right at the end of 1779. When were British troops in Boston? Well, there were British troops in Boston as early as 1768, but the a military buildup began in 1774. The last British troops left Boston in March of 1776. How many of those men were pressed? Zero. How many of the men who marched through Lexington on April 19th, 1775 were pressed into the army? None of them. They couldn't have been. It wasn't legal. Um, the most pressed men I found in any single British regiment during the war. A regiment has about 500 men in it, and the most pressed men is about 37. So the point of all this is that if you read a book that talks about pressing soldiers in the British Army and you want to understand who the British soldiers were fighting in America, impressment, you're talking about just a tiny, tiny, tiny portion of all these soldiers. It's hardly any of them. It doesn't matter very much in the scheme of understanding the army as a whole. So let's look at this alternative to prison. While it was possible during this time period for a magistrate to offer a man convicted of a crime the option of going to the army instead of going into prison. But understandably, this option wasn't offered to just any old criminal. It was only offered to men charged and convicted of petty larceny or misdemeanors. So these are crimes like bigamy, petty theft, burglary, failure to pay child support, um, other minor crimes like this. They're listed in the book. And again, a lot more detail in the description that's in the book. Um, it would, this was not hardened criminals who were offered this option. You don't find the murderers and the career highwaymen and things like that in the army. Instead, it's the people who in general, committed some kind of a crime that shows they, they started down a bad path and a magistrate recognized this and says that this person could do all right if they're given a second chance. So we'll offer them the opportunity to go into the army. Now, not being a bunch of complete idiots, the officers in the British army recognized that they didn't want just any old man in the service. So the army could refuse a man who chose to go into the army instead of prison. So the judge can give him that offer, but the army can say, oh, we, we don't think we want that guy based on what we know about him. In the entire time of the American Revolution, 
we only know of a few hundred cases where magistrates offered men the option of going into the military instead of going to prison. This includes going into the Navy and going into the Army. Um, continuity in the records is hard to find because we can look at the court records and say, how many men were given the option to go in the military? But then we don't always know which of those men chose that option. And then we don't know whether they chose the army or the Navy. And we don't know whether they chose a regiment that was bound for America. The bottom line is with only a few hundred men who even had this choice in the first place, there certainly weren't very many of them in America. It's possible that as many as two or 300 during the entire American revolution got into the army because they had chosen it instead of prison. But that's not very many compared to the total. And it's also important to recognize that this was a voluntary way to get in the army. A magistrate gave the convicted man the choice of joining the army or going to prison. And if he wanted to go to prison, he could do that instead. So we don't have very many criminals in the army. We don't have very many oppressed men in the army. You could be born in the army. And the book talks a lot about this. We don't know how many soldiers it was. I would guess no more than about 10%. Um, this was a great thing for the army. So a young man who was born while his father is in the service, he grows up in military camps. By the time he's of age to join the army, he knows a lot about how the army works. The British writer, military writer said, from this little nursery, some excellent non-commissioned officers may be produced. Of course, because these were men who really understood the army when they were ready to join it. Don't know how many. I've only been able to document a few dozen. And the book, again, describes why this is a challenge. But this was also a voluntary form of enlistment. A young man who came of age was not required to join the army just because his father was in it. He could join or he could not join. And in the book, you'll see an example of a young man who was born in New Jersey in 1760 to a British soldier, spent much of his life in America, including time during the American Revolution. But when he turned 17, he chose not to join the army. So that leaves who? We have hardly any pressed men in the army. We have hardly any convicts in the army. We have a few children but in the army, children of soldiers, but not very many. So where do all these British soldiers come from? Well, it turned out that the vast majority of British soldiers who fought in the American Revolution were volunteers. And they were not just volunteers, they were volunteers who volunteered to serve in the army as a career. We'll talk a little more about that later and you'll see some examples. But these were not men who just signed up for a short stint in the army or a little hitch in the army. They joined the army to serve as a career. Why would someone do that? Well, here's some recruiting material from the British Army during this time period. A lot more about this in the book. Here's a recruiting poster for the 45th Regiment of Foot. Who's the Army looking for? Well, it says it right here. We're looking for all gentlemen volunteers who are able and willing to serve His Majesty and who have courage enough to fight for their country. Ooh, um, the 33rd Regiment of Foot took out a newspaper ad in 1775, the first year of the war. They said they were seeking any able-bodied young man who is fired with ambition, has a roving disposition, and whose spirit soars above the dull sameness of staying at home. And then it adds the caveat at the end that those men only will be taken who promise to be a credit to their officers and an honor to their country. Imagine being a young British a farm laborer, you've worked your whole life in the fields, you're 21 years old, you may have never left your, your local county, and now you see a poster in town with this kind of language, you say, oh, well, well I'm, I, I have a roving disposition, I'm fired with ambition, I want something different in my life. This will really appeal to men like this. Um, here's a poster from the 88th Regiment of Foot. I won't read the whole thing, but it starts out and it says, Arouse Britons for the honor and glory of old England. Now is the moment, my noble-minded countrymen. Now is the crisis of our country's fate. Fly to the standard. And it goes on and on and on. And down at the bottom, it says, The sons of freedom are alone worthy to support the honor of old England. And the conduct of the noble regiment of British volunteers shall prove that Englishmen never wanted courage to defend their wives, their sweethearts, or their firesides. This, this is wonderful language, and this is very appealing, again, to 
to a weaver or a wool comber who may be tired of their work and, and, and want something different out of life. And also it was this poster that gave me the language I needed for the book title. It says, the noble regiment of British volunteers. So I took noble volunteers out of this because this characterizes maybe not who all the men actually were in the British army, but it certainly captures how they thought of themselves when they were enlisting voluntarily into the army to serve as a career. They're seeing this language and feeling that they're qualified to do this. So why does a man enlist? Do we have any specific reasons? We can try to deduce things by looking at doing population studies and economic studies and things but I don't like to take guesses as to why people did things and make assumptions. I figure the only person who knows why they made the choice is the man himself. And unfortunately, for this entire time period, I've been researching British soldiers for years, and so far I've only been able to find 35 men who actually recorded their reason why they enlisted. I could make guesses about the other ones, but I don't want to do that. I want to look at the ones where I'm sure of. It's not enough for a statistical sample, of course, but it does show me some trends. One thing I noticed right away is that most of these people were employed, or if they weren't employed, they had some means of support through their families or other places. So they didn't join the army because they were um, suffering economic hardship. Not one of these 35 men gave unemployment as a reason for joining. That doesn't mean there weren't other men who joined. Remember, there were about 50,000 British soldiers who served at some point in the American War. But until I find at least one who says they joined because they're unemployed, I don't want to make their guess that that was a common reason. I'll go through a few of these reasons. The book has all of them sprinkled through it, but here's a few. Here's a man named William Crawford. He joined the 12th Regiment of Dragoons. Now, I said that I'm not this book isn't about cavalry. So what's this guy doing here? Well, it turns out that after he joined the cavalry regiment, when the American War broke out, he volunteered to transfer into an infantry regiment and go fight in the American War. And he joined the army because he said the king's golden guineas in the form of a bounty won my heart. Well, that's great. So he wanted the recruiting bounty. Sure enough, you get an enlistment bonus. It's about two months pay, not a bad amount of money for starting a new job. Um, Robert Hudson talked about the recruiters who by the fair speeches of the British officers brought he and his friends to believe that the army was the best place. Okay, that recruiting language I just talked about was fairly seductive and effective. John Pink was a tailor in Yorkshire and he was gainfully employed, but he was persuaded by a young man belonging to the army that the army was a very advantageous place for a tailor. And it turns out he was right. The book will talk a lot about tradesmen in the army and how they could prosper quite well by practicing their trades in the army and for the army. Robert Hall joined a British regiment, not from want, but from inclination. William Burke said he had a wish to become a soldier. A man named W. Griffith joined because he said, I could not resist it though I could give no particular reason. All right, this shouldn't be surprising either. Why do a lot of young men join the military during any age? Well, a lot of them just feel compelled to. There's just something in them that means they want to do it. That's why a lot of us do a lot of things, right? We can't always identify a specific practical reason. We just feel we want to. Thomas Sullivan joined the army to satisfy an inclination strongly bent on rambling. A man named Andrew Scott said, it afforded me an opportunity of seeing the world. Valentine Duckett joined because he said, my stepmother and I could not agree. Jonathan Sawyer was disappointed in courtship and James Andrew joined the army to be freed from the clamors of a wife. So you see, we have a variety of reasons. They're all very personal reasons. None of them are reasons that we could likely guess if we were looking at, at metadata and doing different kinds of studies of population and employment and other sorts of things. Um, some people joined because they were dissatisfied with their domestic situation, some dissatisfied with their employment situation, and many just because they wanted something more than their life was offering. Very personal reasons.
there were three time periods of enlistment that I talk about in this book. There's actually three separate chapters in this book about recruiting and training. And that's important because think about, again, Boston, it's April 1775, Lexington, April 1775, British soldiers march out. There's no war going on right now. There's British soldiers in America and there is no war started. So many of the British soldiers, very large portion of the British soldiers who served in America had joined the army during times of peace and then got sent to America and then a war broke out. Other men joined in times of peace and were sent to America after the war broke out, but they didn't join the army to fight a war. They joined the army as a job and then were sent to fight a war. So peacetime enlistment, you join the army, you join as a career, you're discharged until you're no longer fit for service. What does that mean? Well, that means you're fit enough to be able to leave Boston at about 10 o'clock at night and walk to Concord, Massachusetts and do some things there and then walk all the way back fighting all the way. It's about 40 miles of round trip all within a day. Uh, you're fit to sleep in a tent on the ground for an entire summer and into the early winter months. Then we have another period of rec recruiting. When war starts in America, the British Army knows it's going to need some more soldiers. So they start another recruiting effort. They have better recruiting incentives. The enlistment bounties go up. You could be discharged at the end of the war instead of just joining the Army as a career. And you can get a land grant in America when you're discharged, which is a pretty strong incentive for for example, for a young farm laborer in Scotland who's toiling in lousy weather to till rocky soil that belongs to somebody else. And then the army says, well, hey, you can go to join the army, go fight in America. And after the war's over, you'll get 100 acres of land in America. Well, at the beginning of the war, they were probably thinking this land was going to be in Virginia or Pennsylvania or New York. Turned out the land ended up being in Nova Scotia, but if you're that young Scottishman, now you can be toiling to till rocky soil in lousy weather on the coast of Nova Scotia, but at least it's your own land, not somebody else's land. So this is a, an enormous incentive for someone who might otherwise never have any possibility of owning land in their lifetime. Enlistment bounties improve. And then in 1778, something amazing happened. France joined the war. Suddenly Great Britain has an enemy that's not just 3,000 miles away like the Americans. There's an enemy now that you can see on a clear day from the coast of Great Britain. So they need a lot more soldiers, a much bigger recruiting effort. All the same incentives as above apply. The enlistment bounties get higher. We need many more men. Now a lot of these men never came to America. There were other places to go fight the war but men who came to America late in the war enlisted under these different terms. And the method of recruiting and the methods of, um, of training and deploying men changed during these three periods, which is why I've broken them out and separated them in this book. The book is in three parts, a peacetime army preparing for war. So this talks a lot about all these soldiers who were already in the army before a war broke out what their lives were like and how they prepared for service in America. Most of the book is the wartime army and it talks about how the army changed because there was a war going on. And then we talk about what happens to men when their careers in the army are over, whether that occurs during the war or at the end of the war when there's a force reduction. I'm going to talk briefly about each of these three sections of the book and just give an example from each one of the kinds of information that you'll have in here. The first part talks about peacetime recruiting. It gives general background things like the demographics, what different nationalities are in the army. Um, it gives some important information you need to follow through with the rest of the book. What are the ranks? How are they paid? How are men trained? What are career paths like? And in most important, we talk about how the army in America trained before the war began. Remember, the soldiers who were sent to Boston in 1774 were not sent here to fight a war. They were sent here to try to prevent a war from breaking out. 
How does an army get ready for that? How do they prepare for the possibility of war, even though their mission is to try to prevent a war from happening? So we talk about the training, the physical fitness training, the target practice men take, um, how regiments that came from different places all start working together to, in, on Boston Common to work in brigades. And I talked about target practice. If you've read a lot of books about the American Revolution, unfortunately, you've probably come across something somewhere that says that British soldiers didn't aim their muskets. They just pointed and shot. If you've read even worse books about the American Revolution, you found things that say that British soldiers were taught not to aim their muskets, but just to point and shoot them, which really makes no sense for an army that had been using firearms for about 100 years before this war began. They had pretty well figured out that you stand a better chance of hitting something if you aim at it. So British soldiers in Boston before the war broke out spent a lot of time practicing firing at marks, which is where we get the term marksmanship from. It's target practice. The training manual British soldiers use throughout this era talks about aiming the weapon by having the left eye shut, look along the barrel with the right eye from the breech pin to the muzzle, which sounds an awful lot like aiming. If you've talked to a historical reenactor about a British musket at all, if you've had the pleasure of doing that and asked him, Way up on the muzzle of the musket, there's a little piece of metal that sticks up off the top. And if you ask a historical reenactor what that is, unfortunately, there's pretty good odds that they'll say this thing is called the bayonet lug because the bayonet engages it when you put the bayonet on. The bayonet does engage on this thing, true, but if you look at a British training manual from the time period, this is a picture from one right here. And it's got letter E, that little thing on the muzzle pointed out. And the legend says that letter E is called a sight, which gives a pretty good idea that British soldiers were expected to be aiming these guns when they fired them. In fact, British soldiers in Boston from December of 1774 to the middle of April 1775, before the war broke out, each individual soldier had fired about 80 rounds of live ammunition at targets and practicing for the possibility of war in America. This is just one of many examples of the kinds of information that this book goes into. The wartime army, this section talks about training and recruiting during war. It talks about how tactics changed during the war, how the army adapted to fighting. It talks extensively about where soldiers lived. Did you live in a barracks? Did you live in a barn? Did you live in a tent? Did you just wrap yourself in a blanket on the ground? Well, it turns out if you were a British soldier, you probably did all of these things at some time or another. Um, it talks about food and hygiene and health, what men ate and how, how plentiful the food was, um, what kinds of illnesses might occur in the army. I mean, and especially important is how likely were men to get sick and how frequent were these diseases. It talks about how soldiers spent their time when they weren't on duty. And we talk about things like how the fact that there was a war on, how did that change pay? How did that change promotion? How did that change career paths? So one of many examples of the kinds of things you'll visit in this book, was it possible to survive a wound? Well, we think of medical service as being fairly primitive during this time period, and you think of wounds as being fairly bad during this period, and we know that wounds can get infected, and we know that this the state of the art of medical practice was nothing like it was today. So we might expect that it was not very likely to survive a wound during battle. But I don't like to make an assumption like that. I like to look at real data. We have a lot of data about this subject in the book, but I'm going to give just one example of it. The 22nd Regiment of Foot, which arrived in Boston shortly after the Battle of Bunker Hill, later went to Rhode Island. And in August of 1778, they fought in a very big battle called the Battle of Rhode Island. They sent about 400 men into battle, and of those, 11 were killed, and between 50 and 56 were wounded, depending on what return you read. Now, that's quite a high casualty rate for the time period, and it serves us well for study because after this, the regiment didn't do any fighting at all for a long time. So we can isolate and say, all right, of all those men, I can really focus on the wounded ones and what happened to them because I know that they didn't go out and get killed doing something else. We don't have records that tell us very specifically 
the causes of death of soldiers, but we do have records that tell us exactly which soldiers died and when. It just doesn't tell us why. So I can find out how many men in this regiment died in the months following the battle. I don't know the cause of death, but I can guess that some of them died of wounds. Well, it turns out there's one who I know for sure died of wounds because we do have a specific record of that. But if I look at the four months after this battle, these 50 to 56 men wounded, I find out that in this regiment, only three men died in the next four months after the battle. And I don't know the cause of death of any of them, but I know for sure that there couldn't have been more than four men who died of wounds out of 50 to 56 who were wounded, which goes very counter to what I would have just guessed by saying, well, you know, back in those days, medical care was really bad. So most people probably died of their wounds. Turns out they didn't. This is one of the wonderful things about doing research with primary sources and looking at real data. I was surprised by these figures. When I went in deciding I was gonna research this, I thought that it would be far more likely to die of wounds in battle. Turns out, and again, I use a lot of other data besides just this one example in the book, but I found out that if you were wounded in battle during the American Revolution and you were a British career soldier, your odds of survival of those wounds were very high. I thought that was quite remarkable. Um, and I talk about ending careers. There were a lot of ways you could end your career as a soldier. I said you served in the army until you were no longer fit for service, but there wasn't a fixed term of service for most men. So what can end your career? Well, death can end your career. That pretty well does it for you. Desertion ends your career pretty quickly. Becoming a prisoner of war doesn't end your career, but we find that after men were captured and then when the war ended and it was time to repatriate the prisoners, some of those men didn't come back and we don't know what became of them. There are some cases where I know what became of them, but not all of them. So for many prisoners of war, that did end up being the end of their career for one reason or another. Soldiers were displaced. If you can imagine being a soldier in New York and you fall ill and then while you're in the hospital recovering, your regiment sails away to the West Indies or somewhere else. And then you recover from your illness and you're in New York. Where do you go? What happens to you? We talk about these things in the book. Um, I talked about soldiers serving as a career. Some British soldiers who fought in the American Re Revolution had joined the army in the 1750s. Now it's the 1770s. They've been in the army 20 years. They're no longer fit for service. What happens to them? There's a war going on. Do they just get to go home or do they have to wait until the war ends? And of course, soldiers can be discharged from the army when they're no longer fit for service. So let's give one quick little example here. In 1783, the war was over. It was time for British troops to go home. There were still quite a lot of them in America. The 22nd Regiment of Foot was in New York on Long Island in September of 1783. They were given orders to go back to Great Britain. They were also given orders to reduce the size of the regiment. So they discharged 66 men when they were still in Long Island. 66 men who are now told, the army no longer needs you. You can go away and do anything you want to do. You can settle here in America. You can go to Canada. You can sign on to a ship. Whatever you want to do, the world's your oyster. And you've just served in the army through a war. So maybe you're tired of that career. What happens to these 66 men? Well, it turns out that 47 of them re-enlisted in the British Army. They enlisted in another British regiment that was going to Canada instead of going back to Great Britain. And what this suggests to me, again, it's the end of a war and all these men are told, your obligation to the military is over. You can do anything they want. Two thirds of them turn around and they join the army again. The army couldn't have been too bad a career if that higher proportion of men re-enlisted when they weren't required to. Now, why would a man do that? Turns out, I don't know, because not a single one of them wrote down their reason for it, or at least not that I found yet. But I can make a guess here. I could guess that they did it because they got another enlistment bounty. And you'll see examples in the book of men who 
got enlistment bounties two, three, four times in their careers by going from one regiment to another. All right, I've talked a lot about data and I gave a lot of things that deal with statistics and numbers, but the really important part in this book is the individual people, the soldiers. When I see a picture like this, I wanna know who this guy was on the end and how old he was and when he joined the army. And how about the third guy in from the middle? Who, who is he? What's he doing there? I'm gonna give you, introduce four British soldiers here. And there are many hundreds of them talked about in the book in one way or another. But let's pick just a few and we'll pick some who might resonate a little bit with people interested in a talk by the Lexington Historical Society. Let's take James Renison. He was born in 1743 in Kendall County, Westmoreland. He was five foot six inches tall. He had hazel eyes, brown hair, a swarthy complexion, a round visage. And he was a weaver before he joined the army. He joined the 59th Regiment of Foot in 1759, and by 1775, he had become a sergeant, so his career was going quite well. And then he was wounded in the thigh on April 19th, 1775, maybe right there in Lexington. Well, he was wounded, but he was a career British soldier, so however bad that wound was, it didn't stop him from also participating in the Battle of Bunker Hill just two months later. And then, in December of 1775, his regiment was sent back to Great Britain. So woohoo, lucky guy, the war is only eight months old and he's done, right? Well, sort of, the war itself went on much longer. And remember I said in 1778, Spain joined the, or France joined the war? Well, after France joined the war, Spain joined the war. And Spain wanted something that England had, namely Gibraltar. Guess what, England still has it. But from 1778 through 1782, Gibraltar was besieged by the French and Spanish. It's one of the longest sieges in British military history. And James Renison, this guy who was wounded at Lexington and Concord and fought at the Battle of Bunker Hill, was sent to Gibraltar. And he served there for a four-year siege that he endured. And after that, finally, six years later, he was discharged from the army. 1788, he's 45 years old, he's served in the army for 29 years, and he gets a military pension, which was quite common during that era for British soldiers. So what do you suppose a guy like this does now? He spent most of his life in the army, has a pension, he had a wound in a war, and he actually served in a couple different theaters. He did what British soldiers did by the thousands during this time period. He joined the army again. He enlisted in another British regiment and he served for three more years. He was discharged and he was put back on the pension rolls. If you have a pension and you enlist in the army, you, get, you lose your pension, but you go back on full pay. So that's okay. Um, goes back on the pension rolls. Then what happens to him? Well, he did what British soldiers during the, this time period do. He enlisted in the army again. He served in the 95th Regiment of Foot for another six years. At some point during his career, he lost his middle finger. We don't know the circumstances behind that. It may have been the wound he got at Lexington and Concord. So now he's discharged again in 1797. Goes back on the pension rolls. What does he do next? He does what British soldiers do. He re-enlisted in an invalid corps. This is a corps of soldiers who are no longer fit for being deployed overseas, but they can serve in coastal installations in Great Britain. So he really in the invalids. He's discharged in 1802 at the age of 59 after more than 40 years in the army. Oh, and then the following year, he tried to re-enlist again, but he was, he was found no longer fit for service at this point. Now, the difficult thing, if you study British soldiers a lot and you want to talk about somebody with a really remarkable career like this, the hard part isn't finding a guy with a career like this. The hard part is figuring out which one of the thousands you're going to talk about, because this type of career was very, very, very common for British soldiers. If you didn't die in the service and you didn't desert in the service, your odds are pretty good that you were going to serve a career just like this one, 20, 30, 40 years in the British Army. 
Remember, the American Revolution lasted for eight years. This man was in the army for over 40. Let's look at another one. Joseph Dunkerley, he had a very different sort of career. He was born in London in 1752. He was the son of a jeweler in London, so he certainly could have gone to work for his father, but he chose to join the army instead. He joined the 38th Regiment of Foot in the early 1770s. That regiment was sent to Boston in 1774, and he deserted from the army in January of 1776, shortly before Boston was evacuated. What did he do? Well, he became an officer in the American army because, uh, hey, they needed guys with military experience who knew their way around military procedures, and he fit the bill. Um, as the son of a London jeweler, he was probably fairly well educated as well. And so he became an officer. He resigned from the army in 1778 because he was too concerned that he might get captured. And if he got captured, especially deserting the army is bad enough, but deserting and becoming an officer in the enemy army, that's really, really, really frowned upon. So he decided he'd better quit the military before his luck ran out. But he became a painter and a drawing instructor in Boston in the 1780s. He continued, he went to Jamaica, I believe it was, and continued as an artist. And if you look in American art history books, you'll probably find his name because he became one of the most prominent miniatures painters um, in America. This is a painting that he did. In fact, there's a possibility that it's a self-portrait. We don't know that for sure. And he died in Jamaica in 1806, again, and the surprising number of British soldiers had a high level of skill as artists, engravers, and other trades. Um, this man's career can't be considered typical, but it's not stunningly unusual compared to other British soldiers. Let's look at Matthew Hamer, and I forgot to put the animation on the slide, so I apologize for that, because I made this slide just a couple of hours ago for this iteration of the talk. He was born in Burnley, Lancashire, joined the 23rd Regiment of Foot in 1766. He was in the regiment's Grenadier Company when they marched out from Boston on April 19th. And he was wounded twice, once in the right thigh and once in the left foot on that day. But that didn't stop this career soldier from engaging in the Battle of Bunker Hill just two months later where he was wounded for a third time in the right shoulder. And even though he had been wounded three times now within the first two months in the war, that didn't stop him from serving for the entire rest of the American Revolution in the 23rd foot. He wasn't discharged from the army until 1790 when he received a pension after, well, you can do the math, 24 years of service. Again, nothing unusual at all about a career like this. Many of the British soldiers who marched out on April 19th were there either having been in the army for 10, 20, 30 years, or they had that much still ahead of them in the army. Here's his signature on his discharge form, by the way, so he certainly knew how to write his own name. And last man, James Cuff, born 1755, Ireland, six feet tall, light hair, light complexion. He was a barber before he joined the army, and he enlisted in the 62nd Regiment of Foot, which if you're a real British army geek, you'll know went to Canada served on Burgoyne's campaign, and he was captured in Saratoga in October 1777. Why do we care about him when I've been talking all about soldiers from Boston? Well, where were the prisoners of war from Saratoga sent? They were sent to Winter Hill and one other hill that I'm totally forgetting the name of outside of Boston. They were sent in, in Somerset. And uh, they were held there as prisoners of war, but James Cuff escaped from prison. Ah, so what does an escaped British prisoner of war do? Well, the book talks about a lot of escaped British prisoners of war because they did all kinds of different things. But this particular man, James Cuff, enlisted in the American army, enlisted in the 16th Massachusetts Regiment in February 1778. Wow. So he must be really inspired by the cause of liberty, right? To make a move like this, to leave the British army, join the Americans. And that, oh, well, he deserted from the American army. So maybe he's not so inspired by the cause of liberty after, oh, oh, okay, he came back. All right, so maybe he's a good steady patriot after all. He just had a little lapse of judgment there for a few months. Um, went back to the 16th Massachusetts Regiment, 
That regiment was serving in northern New Jersey in Bergen County of September 1780, and that's when James Cuff deserted again. All right, so now we're having real trouble deciding where this guy's loyalties lie, right? He escaped from prison, left the British Army, joined the Americans, he deserts, comes back, he deserts, comes back. What's he gonna do? He gets into British lines in New York and he joins another British regiment on September 14th, 1780. Wow, having trouble keeping up with this guy. His regiment gets sent back to England in November of 1783 when the last British troops leave the American colonies that are now the United States. And that's where we lose touch with him again because he deserted once again from the British Army in June of 1784 and I haven't found a trace of him since. Um, and oddly enough, this too is not a remarkably unusual career for British soldiers. The number of men who served on both sides in the army is surprisingly, or excuse me, the number of men who served on both sides during the American Revolution is surprisingly high. So those are just a few examples of the kinds of people who this book talks about and the kinds of information about their lives and careers that you'll find in it. If you'd like to have a copy of the book and don't already have one, I encourage you to go to a historic site bookstore or to your local independent bookstore and ask them to order it for you. They can get it and these small independent organizations need us now more than they ever have. If you'd like a signed copy of the book, you can order it from my local independent bookstore here in Providence, Rhode Island, using this link that's on the slide. If you like anecdotes about British soldiers, like those last few you just heard, little stories about individual people and their experience in the British Army, I have a blog with many of them on it. You can email me if you have specific questions. And I encourage you to read the Journal of the American Revolution, which is an online magazine, and it's absolutely free to subscribe to. So what do you got to lose? And that's at allthingsliberty.com. I'll leave this slide up here for a few minutes, and I'm going to turn it back over to our host, who will moderate any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful presentation. I'm glad um, so so if anyone has any questions at all about the contents of this book or life in the British Army in general, really, um, if you see down at the bottom uh, of your screen, the Q&A box, that would be the place to put it. Um, one thing that might be interesting to kick this off, though, because we do have a lot of researchers, I'm sure, in our midst. Could you talk a little bit about where you're finding this? these things? Um, oh, are they awesome. coming from pension records and, and enlistment papers, or do these people have autobiographies, perhaps? Uh, well, no, you hit on it in the, in the beginning there. They come from, um, the majority of the information comes initially from British Army muster rolls, which tells the names of all the soldiers. And uh, those are available for most regiments in the British Army. They're in manuscript only. So I'm, I'm an archive geek and I go to Great Britain and spend time sitting in libraries. When most people would be out touring London, I'm sitting in an archive copying down names from muster rolls. But that's not so bad because once I have the names and some basics about a man's career, that, that means any time I come across a letter or some other document or some descendant of a British soldier contacts me, I can look up and find some things about the individual soldier they know and get a basic idea of his career. Um, the demographic information I talk about does come mostly from pension records, which are great about somewhere in the order of half of the British soldiers who served in the American Revolution eventually got pensions. Um, to get a pension, of course, you had to not die or desert or have something else terminate your service prematurely. Um, so we have a pretty good example of pension records to get statistical information. And then I troll through whatever military documents and civilian documents I can find. For example, these men who were prisoners of war and then went to work in the countryside as laborers sometimes petitioned local towns to be allowed to stay in the town after the prisoners left. So I look for records like that and then go back into muster rolls and other documents to build a whole picture of that man's career. <laughs>
So I troll for information anywhere I can find it. And I work with other people who are doing the same thing. And I tell people that doing this kind of research is like trying to do a 20,000 piece jigsaw puzzle when you have to go out and find each of the pieces and you don't know what the picture is going to look like when it's done. Great. And um, are any of these sources easily accessible for folks who might be interested in finding out their own ancestors or anything like that? Uh, most of them, no, <laughs> which is unfortunate. I talked about the muster rolls. They're a, the only place you can get the British Army muster rolls without contacting me is to go to the British National Archives in Great Britain and, and look through them. And, and by the way, they're not indexed. So if you know your ancestor's name, but nothing else, you never want to find it. Um, but if you know the regiment he served in, you have a pretty good chance. The pension information is available through some online services like fold3.com and I believe ancestry.com and a few others have access. So slowly but surely some of these records are getting digitized and becoming more accessible. Um, but they're not simple to use either. And it, it, it takes some uh, puzzle solving. If you know, for example, I, I think my ancestor was a soldier and I think I met, he may have served in Boston. Then you have some clues, but there's a lot of other things to do to try to narrow down and, and, and be able to use the records effectively. So it ain't easy, unfortunately. I've, I've tried and it, it, is not, it is not simple. <laughs> so I'm very lucky to have you. <laughs> oh, thanks. I feel that way about myself sometimes too, actually. <laughs> All right, we have um, some questions here from Herb. Um, when people enlisted after a desertion, weren't they concerned about loyalty? I'm assuming this is the army that they're enlisting in after desertion. Would they be concerned? Is that information they would even know? That's a great question, and, and, and you've partly answered it yourself. Is it information they'd even know? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. Again, hundreds of soldiers on both sides deserted and joined the army on the other side. In, it depends a lot on the discernment of the specific recruiting officer. But yes, often their loyalty was called into question. Um, General Washington set out a, a, law, a rule early in the war saying, don't enlist British deserters. But individual recruiting officers could do whatever the heck they wanted and often did enlist British deserters. Um, on the British side, if a man comes into New York and says, well, I used to be a soldier in the 62nd Regiment of Foot and I escaped from prison and now I'm back here. And oh, by the way, I did serve in the American army for three years. Um, he may or may not be tried by a court martial to decide whether he joined the army, the opposing army, either out of great want, for example, a man might be thrown into prison and on the brink of starvation and be given the only choice of joining the army. And then did that man join the army just as a means of getting close to the front line so he could desert again? And uh, a, a couple thousand British soldiers who were captured during the war did just that. They escaped from prison and some of them joined the American army as a means to be allowed to get close to the front line so they could desert again and return. So men like that were often pardoned, and many of them went on for long careers in the army, and some of them turned around and deserted again a few months later. And this, again, is why we, we have to look at a lot of individual stories to see the diversity, because there was no singular thing that happened to all the men under certain circumstances. I have a lot of stories about these men in the book and, and tons more that I couldn't fit in the book because they're wonderful individual uh, personal stories to see, but, but there's no singular thing. The short answer is, yes, a man's loyalty was absolutely questioned, but sometimes after talking to the man, they said, okay, you, you've answered the questions well, and we, we no longer doubt your loyalty. And do we have a sense if the rest of the population at large um, had any sort of distrust of these people? Do we know if they were um, forthcoming about their past for the, the men that stayed uh, in America? Do we know how many of those people there were? 
Well, there's some great, there's like a few layers of question there. And uh, the answer is sort of, I, I mentioned during the talk that some escaped British prisoners of war escaped because once they were prisoners, they were allowed to go outside of prison. They were given a parole effectively and allowed to work in the countryside. During the war, there was a labor shortage in America, simple trades and farm workers because so many men were off fighting. So prisoners of war were often allowed to go out of prison and engage with local businesses and local farms and work there. And some of these men decided they liked it. So they petitioned the towns to be allowed to stay. Um, many of them married into the local population. So was their distrust? Well, they did have to put a petition saying, please allow me to stay and be a citizen. And in many cases, they were allowed to do so. Um, in one of my other books, British Soldiers, American War, I tell the long story of a man who left the British Army, not so much because he was a scurrilous foul character, but because he fell in love with an American woman. But he never forgot his loyalty to Great Britain and that caused him a lot of trouble later in his life. So some did have problems with their loyalty, others didn't. Um, and again, we have to find as many individual stories as we can to know that because there's no general theme that applies to everybody. So I get into some of that in this book, some of it in my book, British Soldiers, American War, and there's a whole lot of individual stories still to be found. It's an incredible amount of stories, which is great. Um, I know you've been digging up some of these folks that we haven't known about before. Um, and Jane is curious why we don't have more information on the British soldiers who died here and are buried here. Um, I'm assuming you mean among, along the battle road, Jane, um, during one of these battles where there maybe weren't as many casualties as some of the larger ones. Do, do we have an idea of who any of these unknown soldiers are? That's a great question. And to me, they're not unknown. I can tell you the name of almost every single British soldier who died on April 19th, 1775. I mean, I have to look it up in my notes, but all those names are recorded. Um, and in some cases we can deduce which men died where. That's pretty rare because in general, we just have returns that say, here's the men who died that day, but I don't know that this man died between Lexington and me and Monotomy and that man died at Concord, you know. Um, but there's some other things that can help us make some deductions about that. Why don't we know more about it? I'm assuming because nobody has bothered to do the research and the publishing around it. I mean, I, I have some of this information and I'm working on it, trying to get the information out there. A few other people do the same. Um, the information does exist. One challenge we have is that most of the demographic information we have about when a man was born and how old he was when he joined the army, where he came from in Great Britain, most of the data that we have on that comes from pension information. And that means we have it only for men who got pensions. And all those guys who died at Lexington and Conquer didn't get pensions because they were dead. So one of the sad things in all this is that I know more about the men who survived the war than about the men who died. And that's kind of a shame. So I can tell you the names of the men who died in Lexington and Concord on April 19th. I can tell you um, with a little bit more work, how long they were in the army and exactly what their career path was. But in terms of how old they were, where they were born, that I'm not likely to ever be able to tell you unless some more types of information come to the surface that currently isn't known to exist. I think it's sometimes easy to forget how spoiled we are sometimes when researching the American side, especially for this battle where so many people were interviewed within days of it happening so that we do have these accounts of I was standing next to John Smith at this particular rock and he was shot and he fell right there, which I'm assuming was not taking place on any grand scale um, in the real army. That's exactly right. That is exactly right. The, the kind of thirst for specific information just wasn't there on the British side. And this was a from the British perspective, it was a routine operation that a lot of things went terribly wrong, but they didn't 
have the same quest for interviewing people. It also doesn't help us that each individual British regiment, and this is an organization of about 500 men, did its own recruiting. Um, there were soldiers from 10 or 11 different British regiments fighting on April 19th. All those regiments did their own recruiting, kept and managed their own records, and had no central repository in Great Britain that they were required to send those records to. So a regiment deployed to America and brought all its records with it. Some of these regiments had, were almost 100 years old by this time. And then they left America and took all their regiments with them, all their records with them. And sometimes on service later on in India or the East Indies or somewhere, the ship sank and all the records were lost. And sometimes in the early 1900s, some officer said, we don't need those stupid records from the 1700s anymore, get rid of them. So a lot of the, there's a lot of records that were kept at one point, but no longer survive. And every once in a while, one document appears that we never thought we'd have had in a private collection or a basement of a museum. So research goes on, but there, there's a lot that has been lost. And this is why, again, I say it's like, we have to go out and try to find the puzzle pieces. And some of them are very hard to find. We don't even know if they all exist. It's, it's astonishing. I think a lot of people are unaware of how much is floating around out there and just what hasn't been read before. Well, um, and that's, is... that's very true. There's a, most of what I do, people say, wow, you're a researcher. What is that like? And it's like, well, it's about assimilation. It's about going and looking for sources and reading them and taking good notes and then gradually seeing how pieces fit together. So I record names of soldiers. Then I go and look through some town records for a bunch of petitions and it's like, oh, here's a petition from a British soldier. Well, that's nice in and of itself, but now I can take those records I got before from muster rolls and say, which British soldier was it? It was this person in this regiment. Now I can see he, he enlisted at this time and he deserted at that time. Now I can start putting a picture together. And um, doing this kind of research is you engaging the same thing that drives people to collect anything. A lot of people like to collect something, whether it's beer bottles or, uh, or model trains or what have you. So I just say I collect information. And over time, some bits of it start to fit together. Still, the vast majority of British soldiers, I know nothing about them besides their name. But here and there, there are individuals where by some chance or another, there's some other fragments and some other fragments and they start to fit together and, and tell us a little story. And none of the stories are often not even similar to each other. So that's why I say the emphasis is for me is always on the diversity, not on the commonality. That's great. Um, one commonality that you did mention a couple of times that a lot of these folks considered this a, a career for themselves, a formal career. Do you have a sense of the average length of service? Oh, sure. Um, again, when, when we use the word average, we have to be careful because we're talking about a, you know, a mathematical average, which ends up being between 15 and 20 years. But remember, a normal distribution, you know, is it a curve like this or is it a curve like this? You know, and it turns out it's a curve like this. There were a lot of soldiers who served only one or two years. You served until you were no longer fit for service. So you might either acquire an infirmity soon after you joined the army and be discharged. Um, some men joined the army, came to America, got sick immediately and died and had very short careers. Other men like James Renison I talked about served over 40 years in the army. And I know men who served longer than that. <laughs> he, he wasn't the longest one by any stretch. Um, so there's a great deal of variation. Once, once we say average, we run the risk of assuming average means most common. And it doesn't always mean that. <laughs> so yeah, um, 10 to 20 years was pretty common. Um, but quite a lot shorter and quite a lot longer. That's a good point. Um, and for those who did make it, um, 
what sort of a pension were they getting at the end of their service? Was it enough to live on? Uh, it was. It wasn't a lot of money. It was four fifths. Oh, I'm sorry. It was five eighths of their base pay. So it's a subsistence level income. It's not a lot of money, but it's not nothing. I, I liken it to social security or something. You know, is social security enough to live on? Well, it does depend a lot on how you like to live and where you live and maybe what family you've got around. But yeah, the pension was five eighths of the full pay. And the book has a lot of detail about the pension system and how it all worked and how a pensioner actually got that money. Um, we do find a lot of examples of pensioners continuing to work because there was nothing stopping them as long as they were um, physically able to do so. Um, but yeah, it was a subsistence level income, but it was a well-established pension system. And if you served a moderately long career, you had excellent odds of getting a pension in the British Army. That's another, it's something that I believe is probably a enlistment incentive. Why would a man join the army? Well, guess what? How many other careers had a pension during this era? Not very many. I think the answer is pretty close to zero. Um, so the army offers this very progressive modern thing of pension. Now, I don't have any man who said I joined the army because I knew that 20 years after joining, I'd get a pension. But that may have been in the back of some people's minds. All right, and we have um, a follow-up question. Um, who actually got a pension in the army? Who actually got a pension in the army? This is a great question. And again, the book goes into a lot of detail about this, but when you were discharged from the army, the army, wherever you happened to be serving, whether you were in um, Gibraltar or Nova Scotia, when you were discharged, you had the option of just taking whatever money the army owed you and walking away. But you also had the option at the army's expense of going all the way back to London where the pension office was and applying for a pension. And you went before an examining board who you gave them a piece of paper from your regiment that shows you were discharged and it said how long you had served in the army and whether you had any special attributes making you worthy for a pension. And you pled your case before this board. Unfortunately, this board did not keep detailed records of what men said in the back and forth, but we do have a list of all the men who applied for pensions at least. And the pension board decided whether you were a worthy object of his majesty's bounty of a pension. Well, there wasn't a fixed rule around this, but odds were if you served at least 20 years, or if you acquired a disability that prevented you from earning your bread, you were almost guaranteed to get that pension. And again, this wasn't, there, there wasn't a rule that said you had to serve 20 years, but that seems to have been the pension examining board's um, sweet spot because men who serve more than 20 years usually got that pension. Men who serve less than that, especially if they were still in their prime of life, late 30s, early 40s, and they have no physical disability, the army, the examining board would probably say, well, what do you need a pension for? You can still go out and work. But that man in his early 50s who had contracted asthma from being a prisoner of war in America in a damp, musty jail cell for a while and had served 15, 20 years, he's very liable to get a pension. Great. And is this um, something that there were, you know, forms by mail or did the, the Highlanders also have to travel down to London in person to apply at the office. I'm curious if you've read the book or not when you say that, because that's a great question and we talk about that very thing. Um, you had to go before the pension board in person at this time. There was a little pension board in Ireland that some men went to and there was a pension board in London. But if you were in Scotland, yeah, you had to go in person or anywhere in Great Britain. And so this was a real problem for some men. And I've got some examples in the book where that talk about soldiers who had served well in America, some had been wounded or what have you, they're every way qualified for pensions, but they had two things going against them. One is that when they got back to Great Britain, they were really, really, really anxious to get home. And the other is that they didn't speak English.
English. They only spoke Scottish Gaelic, which was called Urs at the time. And they didn't really fully understand what that they had the option of going for this pension. So they go back to Scotland, they start working, raising their family, and then that war wound starts causing them trouble and more trouble, and then they can't work. Now it's the 1790s and I have six children and I can't support my family. And just by good graces, some British military officer who I served with during the revolution hears about this plight and checks into this and says, wow, I remember that guy. He was at the siege of Yorktown. He did great stuff. And now, now he can't support his family. So once in a while, that an officer might go and plead the case before the pension board. This man is too disabled to come and make his case. And he just, he didn't come as soon as he left the army because he didn't really get it about what the rules were and what his options were. And so can we please give him a pension? So that kind of thing happened, but for the most part, the men had to appear before the board. Um, I've got some other tales in the book about men who had a great difficulty getting there. You know, they finally arrived, they lost their paperwork, and now they don't know how to prove that they were in the army and what have you. But yeah, for the most part, you have to appear in person, and that can be problematic sometimes. <laughs> On the upside of that, when you accept your discharge from the army, the army will send you to the pension board first if you choose to go. So, so you have to go there in person, but you get a free trip as long as you understand that that's what your choice is and you go there first. Yeah. But if you don't go there first, then you gotta get there on your own dime or your own shilling. Wow. All right, we have another question from Jane. Back to those who died here in Lexington. There are many, presumably, who died after April 19th of their wounds. We do have some records from um, the local doctor treating people. Um, and we do know that there is one man who is buried in the old burying ground in Lexington. Is there any way of finding out who these individuals were? Or some of the soldiers who maybe were not mortally wounded, but later had to find their way back to the army after having been left behind? Um, in the afternoon of the 19th. Oh, sure. I have names of a lot of those guys, too. Some of them gave depositions when they were in jail. Others, are, um, there are records in the Massachusetts State Archives of the men who were captured on April 19th and spent time in the jails within the next few days. Some of them managed to escape and get back to the British Army. I have a blog entry on one of them, the first prisoner and escapee of the war. Um, Others settled in Concord, for example, uh, Samuel Lee, look up his name on my blog and you'll find uh, he was captured or deserted. It's a little bit fuzzy, but he ended up settling in Concord and marrying and having a nice family, which was kind of undignified of him because he had also left a family in Boston when he marched out on April 19th, but that's, <laughs> that's another story. But yeah, we have records of all these men that all this information survives. Um, I haven't written extensively about those individuals. Again, I got this book about British soldiers all over America, but it, it would be a great topic to examine them in more detail. The information certainly exists. It just needs to be assimilated. Yeah, we have one rather incredible story of a man who ended up in the house next door to the Monroe Tavern, which was where Percy's um, column was on, in the afternoon and ended up in, in someone's bed and was nearly chased out of the house um, uh, by, by the wife of the house. I, I don't imagine that he would have left any records. Um, yeah, that's, this, um, unless we have a name, it, we probably don't know. So a man who was in the house for whatever reason and then got chased out if he didn't leave behind his card, we're not going to know who he was. But if he was captured, then his name almost certainly got recorded. And those records are still around. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. It, it, it says a lot about what we decide to record and how that matters in the future. We have, you know, this story, we know the, the name of the woman who was caring for this soldier unwillingly 
but they did not write down this poor man's name even after being berated for many hours, presumably. Mm -hmm. um, so for for the future, especially this this past year, I've been thinking about what is getting saved and what yeah. details are considered too obvious or too inconsequential to write down. And I think the answer is nothing. Nothing is too inconsequential to write down. Yeah, that's a point well taken, to write it down and to save it. Um, one of my challenges and constant quests is to look for writings by British soldiers during the war. There's a moderate number of writings by officers, but very little written by soldiers. And, and I don't believe it's because the soldiers weren't literate. The book talks a lot about literacy in the army, but rather after the revolution ended on the American side, people who participated in the war understood that they had been involved in something momentous. And so families of American Revolution veterans tended to save things. Whereas on the British side, this was just some foreign war it actually didn't go well. As I said, many of these soldiers had very long careers and their service in America was a short part of it. There just doesn't seem to have been the same impetus to save things, you know, grandpa's old letters. Do we keep them? Do we throw them out? And either a lot got thrown out or they're still gathering dust because people just haven't bothered to pay much attention to them. Not to mention things that were like destroyed during the Blitz in World War II and, and, and other ways things could get lost. But um, but yeah, just recognizing what's consequential and what isn't isn't always apparent at the time, <laughs> close to the event. And far in the future, we have different um, perspectives on what matters and what doesn't. Oh, Herb says he has not read your book yet, but he plans to get it. So I guess he's just has wonderful questions so far <laughs> that are perfect for this particular book. That's great. <laughs> so thank you so that. much for your for your questions, Herb. Um, I think we've reached the end of those written down. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to know anything before we sign off this afternoon? I wish this Q&A had the little dot, 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 like on your phone so that you knew someone was typing. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to unshare the screen, by the way, which I said I was going to do, and I forgot all about it. That's fine. Well, it looks like we have reached the end of our questions. So I would just like to thank you so much um, for giving us all of this information this afternoon. Well, and thank I mean, you to our audience for um, participating so much. That was a, a wonderful discussion that we've had today. And thank you for the opportunity to share the information. Again, it's, I think it's kind of interesting and it's always fun to be able to share it with others. Yes. So hopefully in the future we can do this in person. <laughs> That's true um, too. Yeah. Which would be nice. I think your, your next book coming up is going to be very relevant to us. Um, I believe it's about the light infantry, is it? It's about the Grenadiers and light infantry. <laughs> Doubly relevant. Yeah. Perfect. <laughs> and it does, it, it covers the entire war, but it dwells quite a lot on the early parts and what went well and what went poorly in the early days of the war. Right. Yeah, I think that's that's an important part of the story that we always like to share here is that many of the soldiers that were out on April 19th had a specialty that doesn't often get talked about too much. Um, when we think of them as just a, a line of sort of automatons going down the road, um, not not being able to engage with the wily Americans who were who were off on the side and um, not not realizing that skirmishing was an established thing, but perhaps that's that's another um, discussion for another time. But yeah, <laughs> um, we would <laughs> we would we would love to have um, some more talk about this um, at another Patriot Day, perhaps. All right. Keep me in mind for the future. We will. All right. So I don't see anything else that has come in. So I'd just like to thank everyone else again for coming today. Um, thank you, Don, for your enlightening talk. And we hope to see you all again soon.
Happy end of Patriots Day week, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.